Welcome to another World Heritage Wednesday and I'm at the Blenavon Industrial Landscape in South Wales. Now Blenavon was started by three men, Thomas Hill, Thomas Hopkins and Benjamin Pratt, all of whom were from Staffordshire and had already been involved in the iron industry. Okay. Copying the coking process developed by the Derby family in Colbrookdale in Shropshire, the trio leased the land for Blenavon in 1789 and by 1792 they had three furnaces operating down there in the centre of the valley. Initially, Blenavon produced only pig iron, but from 1817, nearby Genderis, they had established a puddling forge that allowed them to produce much higher quality wrought iron. Now the iron and raw materials are transported around the area by horse-drawn tramways, the remains of which you can still see in the landscape. And these tramways eventually led to the Mamasha Canal that allowed the iron products to be sent over to Newport and then shipped out for export. Now in 1815, the Brecknock and Abergavenny Canal opened and they offered cheap affairs. So the iron products were shipped via the tramways northwards, first to Givolin and then to Llanthoist. Now the partnership was quite fortunate because at the time a little thinking on the Napoleonic Wars was taking place which meant the demand for iron goods was quite high so they had quite a prosperous first couple of decades and soon they had two more forges for a grand total of five operating at the ironworks and as you'd expect clusters of houses for the workers started to emerge all over the valley and some of these are actually preserved at the ironworks itself and you can see recreation of what a typical house from the 1790s would have looked like for the iron workers. Now in the 1820s post-Napoleonic War a depression hit. With the loss of war production there was not the demand for the iron goods and you had a lot of soldiers, ex-soldiers, who had come out looking for work and the British economy wasn't really geared up to handle either case really. Britain and France had effectively been in a state of war since the French Revolution and with this influx of now unemployed soldiers and this drop off in demand for not just the iron industry but for other industries like the textiles that we use for the uniforms this led to the economic depression and during this time a lot of people left the Blenavon sites along with the other valleys in South Wales to go to the Americas. Those that stayed faced pay cuts and layoffs and the workers went on strike on multiple occasions and with a growing nationwide demand for representation of working class within government, trouble was brewing. And this all came to a head in May of 1831 and nearby Merthyr Tidville in what's known as the Merthyr Rising. And the workers took over the ironworks and the, the collieries and the entire town and rioted. And the employers were forced to hide out in one of the hotels called the Castle Hotel where they were being protected by the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders who'd been dispatched to deal with the riotous population. Now, the reality was, was there was only a couple of hundred Highlanders and over 10,000 people were marching on the streets. So they really didn't stand much of a chance, especially once a lot of these rioters managed to get hold of weapons. And basically all that happened was the, the soldiers stuck to just protecting the landowners and the employees who were held up in the hotel. Now, an interesting side note, the Merthyr Rising was the first time that workers had marched under the Red Banner of Defiance, the Red Banner that would later be used by socialist and communist movements around the world. Now, with the violence, many of the families had fled the area, both the town and the valleys, and when more soldiers were sent in, by the 7th of June, the rebellion had been thoroughly suppressed. In total, 24 people had been killed, and one of the ringleaders, Dick Pendellen, was hanged.
Now the violence and ec continued economic depression led to yet further waves of emigration to the United States, particularly to Pennsylvania, where the steel industry started up there. Whereas at Blenavon, the founders had all died and the company had gone into the hands of the next generation. Now, they did try to improve the situation and they opened up another forge at a place called Fordside, which is near where those white buildings are behind me. Now, they didn't have a lot of luck. The forge opened in 1836, but by 1841 it had closed. In the late 1840s, a man called R.W. Kennard took over the place. And he was actually quite fortunate in his timing as well because the railway industry was starting to boom. And so from the 1850s to well into the 1870s, Lynn Avon focused almost exclusively upon railway production. With thousands and thousands of kilometres of rail being built all across the world. There was this really high demand for iron and much of that iron came from Blenavon and the other places in South Wales. At the height of production in the late 1850s and early 1860s, some 27,000 tonnes of iron was being produced in South Wales and that made South Wales itself the largest producer of iron anywhere in the world. Now, to meet this demand, the Fordside Works was reopened and the Puddling Works was moved from Genderis down to Fordside to help improve productivity. And along with that, a sixth furnace was built at the main ironworks. Iron wasn't the only thing that was produced here. From the 1860s, they started to develop steel products as well. And for a brief period, at the beginning of the 1860s, sat again, South Wales became the world's largest producer of steel. Now, Wales's jump ahead in the steel industry was largely the result of the work of two men, Sidney Gilchrist Thomas and his cousin, Percy Carlyle Gilchrist. Now, between the pair of them, they'd figured out a way of removing phosphorus from the iron. Now, this allows you to produce a much higher quality grade steel product. And it was the United States and the newly formed German Empire that really took that technology and ran with it and boy did they exploit it. By 1903, Britain was, had become the third largest producer of steel in the world, having been outpaced by both the United States and Germany. So being unable to compete with the steel industry, much of South Wales switched production to coal as a means of fueling the engines of the industrial age. Now this is where Big Pit comes in. Now Big Pit was originally sunk in the 1860s and it was expanded in the 1880s to have a shaft that was five and a half metres wide, making it the largest shaft in South Wales. And they amalgamated underground several other mines to produce the Big Pit itself. The pit itself seems to have started off as a ventilation shaft, but once they extended the shaft, they used it as the main way down in and out of the mine and closed off some of the other ones. And in the case of the Coity pits, they became the ventilation shaft and they established new air handling units and extractor fans to keep the mine ventilated. At the height of production in 1913, one in four Welshmen was a coal miner and a third of the world's coal production came from these valleys. So why was Welsh coal in such high demand? Well, extensive coal measures in the region, along with some regional folding, have produced a wide variety of coal types in South Wales, from anthracite coal in the west to bitumous coal in the east. And in the case of Glenavon, the coal uh, was very low ash and had a very low sulphur content, making, meaning it was fantastic for steel production. So with a wide expansive use of steam engines in just about everything, the demand for coal globally was really high and Welsh coal proved to be amongst the best quality. And that's why Blenavon became so important. And in total in the 19th and early 20th centuries, some 3 billion tonnes of coal had been extracted from South Wales. And after World War I, the demand for coal died down, partly because again, like after the, with the Napoleonics, there was a drop off in demand generally, but also because a lot of warships had been switched to using oil fired engines instead of coal fired engines. Now, for the coal miners, in the 1930s, they'd added a canteen and a medical centre, and perhaps most importantly, a bathhouse. Now, all of this was done to help improve the lives of the miners themselves, even though the actual number of miners was starting to drop off as that demand in coal had also started to drop off. Post Second World War, nationalisation came in 1947, and full mechanisation of the coal industry had come by 1967. And at this point, the workforce had dropped to about 500 people, sort of about a, roughly about a quarter of what it was before the First World War. And then by 1980, the colliery finally closed for good. 
and it reopened in 1983 as a mining museum with the ex-miners showing people around the site. Now the mine itself, because it's still exposed coal seams, the mine itself is still subject to the same regulations as an active coal mine. Now this means that you're not allowed any non-mining industry standard electronics down in the mines. That includes phones, cameras, car keys, anything that could potentially create a spark as although it's highly unlikely the chance of coal gas explosion is still there. So sadly I've got no pictures for you of the coal mine itself but there is a museum in one of the nearby buildings that gives you a good idea of what it would look like down there. Now you can take tours down there and to be honest the tours are free and it's fantastic. It's well worth it if you're in the area going for a visit down one of those down the mines. And it's not just Big Pit and the ironworks that make Blin Avon so special. It's the whole landscape. If you think the title of the UNESCO World Heritage Site is the Blin Avon Industrial Landscape. And there's so much here that just shows the mining industry and the iron industry that was so dominant here. I mean, you look at this valley now and you never would have guessed that this was one of the world's largest producers of iron and steel. It just looks so tranquil. But right where I'm now, I'm actually sat on top of what, what used to be the first strip mine in the UK. It's known as the Canada Works, named because during the Second World War, the Canadian Army took over this part of the landscape and started stripping away the top of the hillside to extract the coal and the iron for use in the war industry. There are other areas to this landscape. There's things like the railway lines and the steam engines that are here. You've got the old tramways and other parts of the, of the forges such as Gendelis. You've got the fisherman's pond which was used as a reservoir. You've got the valley of Kumdurfin where there's actually a viaduct buried underneath 25 meters worth of spoil from the later mining works. It's just such an important landscape when it comes to the history of coal mining and iron production and the history of South Wales in particular. Now the 10 criteria on the UNESCO World Heritage List, the Navon fulfills parts 3 and 4 in the sense it's a fantastic and exceptional example of a, the industrial landscape of the 19th century and it gives you a real feel for what the world was like. For these reasons it was added to the UNESCO World Heritage List in 2000. Now for myself, I found it fantastic a reminder of a time when coal was king and Wales powered the world. <laughs>